Final ending to correcting her. Part 1 down below. Hit that sub button if you apparicate my work during a week night. Wow, that's unexpected. Rick exclaimed. We could have an even family now. They could even play games together. This is surprisingly good news. It's not as good as you think, Georgia replied bitterly. I'm too old for this. I've decided not to keep it. No, please, Georgia. Rick pleaded. It's more than just my age, Rick, Georgia explained sadly. I'm not sure I can bring another child into our strained relationship. I'm not as resilient as I used to be. Our other children were conceived with love from my deep affection for you. But after your repeated betrayals, my feelings are uncertain. And this child wasn't born from mutual love, at least not on your part. After years of rebuilding trust since your last betrayal, I was just beginning to feel love for you again. But how did this happen? There I was, filled with love, and you were just trying to mask another betrayal. Perhaps there's a different perspective to consider, Rick suggested. Remember, Georgia, not long ago you were keen on having another child. We tried, but it just didn't work out. Maybe this is a sign that our love is still strong and we can create something beautiful together. I promise, no more mistakes. I'll do everything in my power to maintain our bond. I'm prepared for whatever comes our way, much more than before. I'm committed, Georgia. I even agreed to sign those documents you mentioned as soon as I'm able. Georgia, maybe give him another chance, I proposed. Why do you think this involves you? She questioned. Do you understand that I'm going to be incredibly frustrated with him at times? That's expected during any pregnancy, but add to that the emotional turmoil from his past actions. It's overwhelming. Will you be there to support me? Of course, Georgia, I reassured her. If you're feeling stressed, come over and relax in my hot tub, or if you need someone to talk to, I'm here. I can even help communicate your feelings to Rick. Maybe you could be the godfather to our child, Rick chimed in with a hopeful smile. I'll consider it, Georgia replied, then teasingly called to Rick, come on, let's go get your medication. She gave me a playful wink. Thank you, Stevie. You're a true friend. You deserve so much better. As she spoke, a tear trickled down Rick's face. I could see his genuine remorse. Yet, every time I felt a hint of guilt about the complicated situation, I remembered the betrayal from both of them. They had each hurt me deeply, and this was the tangled web we found ourselves in. The following Saturday morning, I awoke to the sounds of someone in my kitchen. Expecting Georgia, I was surprised to see Sarah instead. Stephen, you really need to keep the house tidier, she remarked. I started to question her presence, slightly taken aback. It's Saturday morning, Steve, she reminded me. You said I could visit during the weekend, remember? She had prepared breakfast, and we sat down to eat. Afterwards, we stepped out onto the deck to chat. She seemed anxious, yet somehow more confident than before. Perhaps my decision to finally talk to her, or something else, had bolstered her assurance. Out of nowhere, I asked, why? The question caught her off guard. Why what? She responded, seeming to buy time to gather her thoughts. Why did you get involved with Rick? Why did you jeopardize our marriage? Wasn't I enough for you? How can I trust anything you say after our vows were broken? Why should I even consider giving us another chance? I burst out in one long, breathless tirade. Why? Her expression revealed her realization of the conversation's difficulty. If you deceive me even once, it's over, I warned. Steve, this is difficult, she started. When we first met, I wasn't exactly inexperienced. But truth be told, my past encounters were limited. I was timid and overly self-aware. I had a poor self-image, especially about my appearance, which often drew unwanted attention and ridicule. You transformed that, Steve. You made me feel attractive and helped me see myself in that light. You also made me feel cherished and valued. I would do anything for you, and remember the adventurous things we've done. Like that time at my cousin's wedding in the church. For years, our desire for each other seemed insatiable. Initially, I did it to make you happy, but over time, I started to desire it as much as you. When you returned to school, I was so proud and supportive, knowing it was for our future. You wanted to provide for me out of love. I understood the pressures you faced in school, but it affected our intimacy. I knew your love for me hadn't waned, but your focus was divided. Our physical connection had reduced significantly. Steve, I was longing for more. I didn't want to burden you further, so I kept quiet. My frustration grew to the point of having vivid dreams. I tried to find a solution on my own, experimenting with alternatives, but they fell short. I even hoped leaving them around might spark a conversation, but you never noticed. Then I overheard your conversation with Rick about his similar situation, hoping it might lead to a change, but nothing happened. A few weeks later, Rick caught me in a moment of solitude in our hot tub, sparking some thoughts about him. He and I shared similar struggles. Time was ticking as your graduation approached, and I felt cornered. Rick seemed like the right choice for my impulsive plan. He wasn't my type, but our mutual need and equal stakes in secrecy made him a safe option. Yet, when I broached the subject, he outright refused, leaving me embarrassed. But I persisted, albeit inappropriately, reassuring him of our discretion. After relentless persuasion, he relented for a brief, unsatisfying encounter. I swore it would be a one-time mistake, a vow that lasted barely three weeks. Our encounters were far from romantic, they were hurried and impersonal. 
Despite the lack of intimacy or variation, he seemed overly impressed, attributing qualities to me that were more a contrast to his own experiences. We met a few more times, each as lackluster as the first. The cost of these fleeting moments was immense, trading years of love for mere minutes of regret. As your graduation neared and our own intimacy rekindled, I ended things with Rick. I never intended to hurt you, and my actions were not born from a lack of love for you, Steve. I regret it deeply. Your confusion was palpable. How could you risk what we had for something so trivial? You asked. I didn't want to burden you further, I explained, seeing the toll your efforts were taking. In your frustration, you demanded, what now? How can you prove your love to me? Sarah, I think you believe you love me, I began. But this isn't about love. It's about trust, about faith. You shattered my heart, Sarah. How can I be sure you won't do it again? I promise, it won't happen again, she pleaded. And why should I trust your promise? I questioned. We spent the whole day discussing our future. Eventually, we decided to try counseling. It was a beginning. Yet, for me, it might have been just a stalling strategy. Sarah had packed her car, ready to move back in. My agreeing to counseling seemed like a positive step for her, a glimmer of hope. But it also meant we were far from reconciling. For me, the real reason I opted for counseling was to maintain some distance, to sort out my own tangled feelings. Isn't it good that we're trying? I asked her, what do you expect from me? You think I'd just accept your excuses and welcome you back? That we just pick up where we left off? Why not? She retorted, if you love me as you claim, why can't you forgive me? It's been weeks, Steve. I miss you deeply, and I know you feel the same. What's holding you back? Her mention of knowing my actions alarmed me. I thought she might be referring to her own mother or someone else she had spoken to. I spoke with my mom and sister, she revealed. Mom was furious with me for my actions. She couldn't look beyond how much I hurt you. I think she's on your side. What's ironic is that she doesn't know I'm aware of dad's past infidelity. It's puzzling why they're still together. Maybe because despite it all, they love each other and they have a family, I suggested. So, without kids, I have no chance. She asked. My sister supports me, right? What do you mean? I was puzzled. She offered to make amends with you, to balance things between us, and you refused, she said. That made me realize how much you care. I'll do whatever it takes to win back your trust and love. Let's try counseling, I suggested. We gave counseling a try, and I was patient. It took me eight weeks before I felt ready to let her move back in. During that time, a friend of mine, who owned several rental properties, lent me a small but comfortable furnished studio. Georgia was fond of the place. Her pregnancy seemed to make her more affectionate, and I appreciated our time together even more. So, you decided to take her back. She asked one afternoon, post-affection. Yes, but only because you advised me to, I replied. And I didn't rush it. I made sure she proved she deserved to come back home. And how much time do we have? She inquired. We've got another hour, I said playfully, as I affectionately embraced her. No, I meant, how long before you're tired of me? She asked. Georgia, you're always going to be important to me, I assured her. I still have feelings for Sarah, but you're my choice, always. Sarah has her roles, but it's different with you. But eventually, you'll have to be more generous with Sarah, she said with a hint of jest. It's hard to focus on her when I'm with you, I admitted. My moments with Georgia were always tender and caring. I felt connected to our growing baby. My encounters with Carla, however, were more adventurous. She seemed to be making up for lost time, exploring new experiences with me. There were weeks where our activities were quite experimental. Meanwhile, at home with Sarah, our relationship was more reserved. We continued with counseling, progressing slowly. Both Georgia and Rick often visited. Georgia would relax in our hot tub, while Rick and Sarah kept their distance, understanding that Georgia and I sometimes needed to share our thoughts. There were moments when Georgia would signal Rick, who would then encourage me to join her for a conversation. Rick was trying hard to regain her favor, not realizing his chances were slim. He would often share his hopes for the baby with me. I'm going to name him after you, Steve. Sarah had been affected deeply by Rick's earlier actions. She was making every effort to mend things between us. Eventually, with Georgia's approval, I began to grow closer to Sarah again. She thought the initial awkwardness between us was due to my unresolved feelings about her past mistakes. In truth, I was trying to understand what made being with Sarah unique. She lacked Georgia's finesse and her mother's intense passion. Sarah's youth and vitality were her most notable qualities. As Rick's injuries healed, he began to visit more to help me with my Chevelle project. Gradually, our friendship started to rebuild. Sarah couldn't understand this. Why can you forgive him but not me? She demanded. You hurt me more because I loved you more, I replied sharply. Rick was a trustworthy friend, nothing more. You and I, we shared our deepest thoughts and dreams. Healing from that kind of betrayal takes much longer. One bright December morning, as Rick was at work and I had just arrived home, a surprising event unfolded. Sarah had prepared breakfast, wearing her most appealing nightgown, and had adjusted her schedule to match mine. The sudden ring of my phone caught us off guard. It was Georgia calling. Within minutes, we were at the hospital's maternity department. I had arranged a wheelchair and hurried Georgia inside. 
The nurses took over, and I waited anxiously for news. Rick arrived about 40 minutes later, grateful for my help with Georgia. He had rushed home first by mistake, only to find that Sarah and I had already taken Georgia to the hospital. By the time he got there, Georgia had given birth to a beautiful, healthy baby girl, surprising us all since her previous children were all boys. After the baby was cleaned up, Rick, Sarah, and I went to see her. Rick was ecstatic, hugging me tightly and even Sarah, marking their first contact since their indiscretion. Rick was visibly elated by the birth. Sarah, on the other hand, swiftly moved away from him, casting a glance at me to reassure that she remained committed to our reconciliation. One by one, we each had a chance to visit Georgia. Rick was the first to go. His visit was brief, and when he emerged, his smile was mixed with a hint of concern. She's not too happy, he remarked. But don't take it personally. She's always a bit irritable after giving birth. She repeats the same thing every time, insisting this is absolutely the last one. But after seeing our little girl, I believe there might be room for one more. Sarah, she's asking for you. Sarah spent a considerable time in the room with Georgia. She later shared with me that Georgia had offered her the role of the baby's godmother, attributing it indirectly to Sarah's past involvement with Rick. According to Sarah, if it weren't for her brief relationship with Rick, he might not have rekindled his passion with Georgia as intensely. Sarah graciously accepted the role, vowing to rebuild the trust she had lost with Georgia. Georgia emphasized that the arrival of a new life was an opportunity for a fresh start, urging them to leave the past behind. When I was finally alone with Georgia, my joy was overwhelming. I was filled with pride and happiness, barely containing my emotions. I love you, Steve, she said to me. And I love you, Georgia, I replied. Our baby, she's absolutely perfect. My love for her is so deep, it's almost overwhelming. I have feelings for her father too, Georgia admitted. I'm usually quite annoyed with him. He should have been here first, but thankfully, you and Sarah were here. Otherwise, she might have been born at home. Georgia, he was just anxious, I tried to reassure her. Then she revealed the baby's name with a playful smirk, I named her Stevie. Seeing my shocked expression, she smiled. She's my daughter, and I can name her whatever I like. It's a little jab at her father. But Stevie, I've been thinking. Girls grow up fast, don't they? I wonder, when Stevie's 15, will things be different? I'll be 60 then, and you'll be 45. Will you still want to be with me? Georgia, I'll always be there, I assured her warmly. That's good to hear, she smiled. By that time, Rick will be well into his 60s. As a retirement gift, I might just leave him. The kids will be grown up by then. But why do you look so surprised? Georgia, right now, all I want is to hold you close and share a tender moment with you. She's just so stunning, it's almost overwhelming. I can't help but feel emotional. I love you. This is truly the happiest day of my life. Well, why don't you find a private place to let those emotions out? She said with a playful smirk. We can't give our friends any reason to start gossiping. And you'll get your hug as soon as I'm back in a few days. But until then, maybe you should spend some time with Sarah. I wouldn't want you feeling lonely. It'll be about six weeks before the doctor gives us the green light to be close again, and I don't want you feeling too eager and overwhelmed. Georgia, I would never. I started to protest. I know, honey, she replied. I just want you to be happy. You're a young, vibrant man and you deserve companionship. That evening, back at home, Sarah was quite affectionate. What's got into you? I asked her. Steve, I'm just feeling really lively, she said with a spark in her eyes. I went outside to the backyard, and she followed me, wearing her short nightgown. What are you up to? She inquired, watching me curiously. I'm on a quest for a snake, I joked. If I don't find one tonight, I'll check the pet store tomorrow. You always had a sense of humor, she said with a smile. We sat together on the porch, and she embraced me. It felt like a return to better times. Perhaps the birth of my daughter had helped us both move past certain issues. The only snake I'm interested in is a metaphorical one, she quipped, and then she kissed me. The look in her eyes spoke volumes of her affection. Then she stood up and walked towards the house. I'll bring you a drink, she offered. As she entered the house, I couldn't help but notice her silhouette against the nightgown. It sparked a sense of desire in me. I followed her inside and gently led her to our living room. We shared a passionate kiss on the sofa. The intensity of our connection was undeniable. I then showed my affection for her, starting from the top of her head and making my way down, taking my time to appreciate her. I cherished her intensely, her body responding eagerly under my touch. She reciprocated with equal fervor, her attention devoted entirely to me. There was a moment, though, when my mind wandered, comparing her to past experiences. However, the sight of her, in all her allure, quickly brought me back to the present. We moved to the sofa, our passion undeniable. I was enveloped by a mix of surprise and desire, she, at my unexpected intensity, and I, rediscovering the unique connection we shared. Our rhythm was instinctive, a dance we both knew well, yet it felt new and exhilarating. Her eyes briefly held a hint of apprehension, but it soon melted into trust and affection. She drew me closer, her embrace an unspoken invitation to explore further. Her words were a whisper of consent and desire, fueling my ardor. Our closeness deepened, our connection manifesting physically and emotionally. In the heat of the moment, I considered a new boundary, one we hadn't crossed before. 
Her initial hesitation gave way to eager anticipation, guided by my reassurance and care. There was a moment of vulnerability, hesitation on my part, fearing she might uncover secrets of my past. But it passed, my focus returning to her, to us. I admired her, every curve and line of her body, a beauty that had always captivated me. Memories of others being mesmerized by her charm made me smile. She entrusted me with a part of her no one else had reached. Her trust in me was complete, her desire clear in her eyes. I confessed my own uncertainty, a half-truth to keep my past concealed. Our connection, physical and emotional, was a powerful testament to our bond. It was a journey of discovery, trust, and shared desire, a moment that belonged only to us. Come closer, she implored with a sense of urgency in her voice. Her desire was palpable, transcending the anticipation that had been building between us. With a mix of tenderness and excitement, I aligned myself with her, ensuring her comfort at every step. As we connected, she gave a gentle sigh, a subtle acknowledgement of the intensity of the moment. I paused for a moment, allowing her to become accustomed to our closeness. I love you, Steve, she whispered. Her words resonated with me, awakening emotions that had been dormant for far too long. I started to pull back, but she was insistent, seeking more of our shared connection. Steve, don't stop now, she whispered. Let's not lose this moment. Let's go slow. With deliberate care, I continued, mindful of her every reaction. It was like navigating uncharted waters, yet we were in it together. Gradually, we found a rhythm that suited us both. This feels so different, she said softly. Do you like it? Yes, it's incredibly intense, I replied. I love it. She chuckled lightly. You men are so straightforward. As she grew more comfortable, our movements became more fluid, a dance of shared intimacy. How does this feel? She breathed, her voice thick with emotion. Overwhelmed by the depth of our connection, I reached a peak of emotion. Afterward, I lay beside her, enveloping her in a gentle embrace. As we both regained our composure, I noticed tears in her eyes and immediately felt concern. Sarah, I'm so sorry, I started, worried I had overstepped. She quickly reassured me, wiping away her tears. It's okay, Steve. These are tears of happiness. This is the first time in a while you've truly wanted me. We got lost in the moment. And now, I think I'm ready for us to start thinking about a family. Her words opened a new realm of possibilities for us, a future. After thinking we had reached the end, your gaze as you turned me around spoke volumes. For the first time since our breakup, hope seemed tangible. You had a longing in your eyes, a desire that resonated with me. I was no stranger to heartache, having made regrettable choices in the past, but in that moment, I felt a connection with you that was uniquely ours. We drifted off into a peaceful sleep, wrapped in each other's embrace. The next morning, I awoke to find you playfully engaging with me. Surprised, I gently pushed you away, but noticed a hint of disappointment in your eyes. To lighten the mood, I kissed you, drawing you closer. A playful banter ensued about our previous night's escapade, leading to a humorous moment as you rushed to the bathroom. I followed, offering comfort and a light-hearted joke as you brushed your teeth. As I geared up for my morning run, you playfully chided me about my post-exercise routine. We joked about the envy others might feel, but your tone turned serious as you reassured me of your commitment and regret for our time apart. The pain of separation was evident in your words, and you promised a renewed fidelity. While jogging through the park, I pondered the complexity of love. The capacity to love multiple people, a spouse, mother, children, is a common human experience. I realized my situation, though unique, was not extraordinary. Life eventually found a pleasant rhythm. Each day, I returned home to the comforting presence of Sarah. Our lives intertwined beautifully, filled with shared moments and cherished memories. Meanwhile, Georgia and I maintained a close bond, finding time for each other amidst busy schedules. My mother-in-law, Carla, embarked on a journey of self-discovery, bringing unexpected adventures and surprises into our lives. I wasn't taken aback when she suggested a bit of role-playing, tying herself up for a more adventurous experience. She had this peculiar preference for switching the sequence of our activities, especially when it involved something a bit unconventional. She proposed that we engage in our usual intimacy first, before introducing any other playful elements. Her ideas were sometimes quirky, like the time she showed off her skills in a more intimate context and then asked for a somewhat unusual request. I remember spending a considerable amount of time trying to fulfill her request, but it was challenging to meet her expectations fully. She even had me document the moment with photographs. We took quite a few photos, actually, and she was meticulous about keeping them secure. My father-in-law wasn't very tech-savvy, so Carla managed to transfer the photos from her phone to a securely encrypted file on her computer. The file was designed to automatically close if left idle for more than 30 seconds, ensuring privacy. Her password was a complex phrase, not just a simple word, with a hidden character count and clever substitutions of numbers and symbols for letters. For instance, dollar signs replaced some S letters, and 7 took the place of T in certain instances. I was confident that her password was uncrackable. I was also relieved that, except for some parts of me, my identity wasn't captured in those photographs. As time went on, I enjoyed several bonuses both at work and at home. 
For instance, after Georgia had recovered from childbirth, she and Sarah began working out together. Georgia showed Sarah some techniques to enhance control in intimate moments. Sarah even picked up some of Georgia's unique movements. The first time Sarah surprised me with her new skills, I was caught off guard, reacting more intensely than ever before. I got out of bed, feeling a mix of surprise and frustration. Sarah, I exclaimed. I suspected she had discovered how much I appreciated Georgia's techniques. She sat on the bed, laughing. I've got complete control now, she said, still laughing. I can influence your reactions whenever I want. Where did you learn that? I asked, a mix of curiosity and annoyance in my voice. Who have you? Suddenly, she understood why I was upset. Stevie, dear, I promised you that you'd be the only one for me, she chuckled. Georgia showed me how to please you. She said Rick really enjoys it. She told me it's a way to keep things exciting, especially after having kids and all the changes that come with it. I settled myself at the edge of the bed. Everything all right, dear? She asked, embracing me. Yes, I replied. I was just, just what, dear? She probed. Worried, I confessed. I was afraid of losing you. Stephen, I've made a vow to be only yours, she reassured me. You're the only one I want. How can I make you feel more secure, dear? Well, could you do that special move again? I asked. The one where you, um, where we feel really close. I like that. Over time, our bond strengthened. We even started going on family vacations together. I tried to connect with George's sons too, but everyone could see the special connection between Stevie and me. Even as a toddler, she'd waddle over and sit with me while her brothers played outside. Sarah found it endearing. She joked that it was good practice for when we had our own kids. Georgia and I were shocked the day Stevie looked up at me and said, da da. To our surprise, Rick and Sarah found it amusing. Watch this, Rick said, lifting Stevie onto his lap. Da da, she repeated. Georgia tensed, noticing something Rick missed. He then placed Stevie on Sarah's lap. Da da, she said again. Looks like she calls everyone da da, Rick laughed. Georgia and I were a bit older when Stevie was born. There's always talk about older parents and their kids. They say such kids might not be the quickest, but I think she's quite sharp, I chimed in. Sharper than your boys, I'd wager. I was thankful it was dark on our deck, so no one saw Georgia's subtle nudge to quiet me. You're just biased because you're her godfather, Rick joked. And because she always comes out to watch him working on the cars, Sarah said with a chuckle. I bet in about 20 years, I'll have to gently nudge her away from my husband. She seems quite fond of him. We all shared a laugh at that, and looking back, it stands out as one of the brightest moments in my life. Sarah and I, along with Georgia and Rick, were relaxing on our deck, dipping in and out of the hot tub, enjoying a barbecue as the sun set. Two months later, I was eagerly awaiting an even more special occasion. Rick's sister and her husband were visiting. Instead of leaving the kids with Mary Sue, they took them to the zoo on Saturday, a day Rick and I had been eagerly anticipating for almost three years. We woke up early that morning, and after seeing the kids off, Rick and I joined Georgia and Sarah for the Woodward Dream Cruise. Sarah and I were in my car. That morning, Sarah mentioned she needed to talk to me once we got back. She wanted to postpone the discussion so as not to spoil the day. Let me guess, I ventured. You want a divorce? She looked at me, surprised. Never, she replied. But you might. Tears welled up in my eyes, but she approached me calmly. No tears now, she said. I haven't betrayed you. It's nothing like that. We just need to think about some things. It's not urgent. We can talk later. Let's just enjoy today. The drive to Woodward was exhilarating, almost like a race. Rick was thrilled, often pulling up beside me in his Chevelle to rev his engine. You've done an amazing job with this car, Sarah complimented me. Rick seemed to hear her, because as we stopped at a traffic light, he called out to me, praising my car. Suddenly, as I glanced at Rick, I instinctively revved the engine just as a truck took a turn too widely and collided with my Chevelle. I stopped and rushed back to the crash site. Georgia, I yelled in panic. My beautifully restored car was now a wreck. Rick and Georgia were hurt and tangled together. Others stopped to help, and I could hear the distant wail of sirens. The truck driver, disoriented, climbed out of his vehicle. I rushed over to him before anyone else could. I clenched the front of his shirt and delivered a series of forceful punches to his face. My hand was injured as his glasses with metal frames broke under the intensity of my hits. Even when others intervened to pull me away, I couldn't stop my aggression. When my punches couldn't reach him, I resorted to kicking. It took three people to restrain me and keep me from him. I'm going to get back at him, I yelled furiously. As I finally calmed down, I learned that the fire department had to use specialized equipment to rescue Rick and Georgia from their car. Sarah approached me and urged me towards my car. We need to get to the hospital, she said with a worried tone in her voice. I could tell from her voice that the situation was serious. I'll drive, she insisted. You're not in a state to drive. I didn't argue and just got into the car, my mind in a haze. Upon reaching the hospital, the emergency personnel recognized me from the accident site. Before I knew it, I was on a stretcher with a nurse attending to me. My shirt was damaged, and I had several noticeable cuts on my arm, thigh, and abdomen. 
The nurse began treating me and I insisted I was fine, but soon I drifted off, thanks to the medication she administered. When I woke up, Sarah was there to rouse me. I can't believe they sedated me, I said, frustrated. They shouldn't have done that without my consent. Let's focus on the current situation, Sarah suggested. You need to see Rick. He's in a critical condition and they're struggling to control his bleeding. Georgia is still in surgery. She gave me another shirt to wear over my bandages. I put it on and walked carefully down the hallway with Sarah to the critical care unit where Rick was being treated. The sight of him, surrounded by tubes and bandages, struck me. Deb, Rick's sister whom I knew well, was in tears. Her husband, Tom, was discussing with some doctors. Deb approached and hugged me, but I winced in pain from the contact. Steve, are you all right? She inquired. I'm managing, I replied. I got these cuts trying to help them out of the car. Your hands seem to be the most affected, she noted with a slight smile. I heard from some of the witnesses, but the other guy won't be pressing charges. They took care of his wounds before escorting him to the police station. Sweetheart, I'm heading up to check on Sarah's operation, Sarah mentioned, patting my shoulder before she left. I glanced over at Rick, tears welling up again. He was encircled by medical staff. His condition seemed dire. Then, he noticed me and weakly smiled. Approaching his bed, I saw his struggles. You took your time getting here, he joked weakly. A trickle of blood stained his lip, sliding down his chin. Rick, conserve your energy, I urged, tears rolling down my cheeks. Don't strain yourself speaking. What's the use of saving energy? He chuckled. To them, I'm practically gone. They're baffled by my survival. But I have a few things to settle before I leave. I need to see Georgia once more. And I had to see you, my friend. He coughed up blood, his body convulsing. The doctors hurried over, and I stepped back. They cleared his mouth and throat. His heart rate, feeble as it was, steadied again. He couldn't sit up but gestured for me to come closer. I moved towards him, dead beside me. Thanks for letting me be your friend again, he said. And we're square now. What do you mean? I asked, confused. Deb was right there with me. Deb's aware, he revealed. Aware of what? I inquired. About my brother's infidelity, repeatedly, Deb said, her voice cold. And that his last indiscretion involved your wife. Most crucially, Georgia sought revenge on him last time by being with you. And little Stevie isn't biologically related to me. Not long ago, I felt uneasy when Stevie called you daughter, he continued. It was different. And I noticed how both you and Georgia reacted when she said it. I need you to know. Our talk was cut short by a commotion outside. A stretcher was wheeled in with Georgia on it, her condition looking critical. They were urgently administering blood as they moved her into the room. Georgia was gently positioned next to Rick, and her eyes fluttered open, revealing a sleepy gaze. It seemed that just the act of waking was a strain for her. I promised to wait until you could forgive and love me again, he uttered, each word accompanied by a painful effort. Dear, I never stopped loving you, Georgia responded faintly. Rick gave one final, contented smile, then his head rested on the pillow, lifeless. The continuous beep of the monitor announced his departure. Stevie, I love you dearly. Please look after our little one, Georgia whispered, her own monitor soon echoing Rick's in a somber duet. Overwhelmed, I stumbled out of the room, finding refuge on a hallway bench. Time seemed to stand still as I sat there, flooded with memories. I reminisced about the good times with Rick, before and even after his indiscretion with Sarah. And Georgia, once just a peripheral figure in my life, had grown to hold a significant place in my heart. Her loss nearly stopped it from beating. The days that followed were a haze. I spent hours on the deck, watching life go on around me. Sarah occasionally coaxed me to eat and busied herself rearranging the house, though I couldn't fathom why she'd do that now. I remember her smiling at me, reassuring me that time would heal the wounds. The funeral was a blur. Rick and George's two older sons were present, but their youngest and little Stevie were too young to understand. Deb and her husband were kind, encouraging me to visit the boys and promising to bring them by. I recall Sarah discussing mundane things with Deb, like car seats. Then, suddenly, I snapped back to reality. She's gone, I managed to say, the words scraping through my throat. Sarah was instantly at my side. I'm so sorry, honey, she comforted. I know how much she meant to you. Sarah, you can't even imagine, I replied, finally letting my emotions pour out. She stayed with me, offering her support. I've been distant, Sarah, I admitted. Was there something you wanted to discuss? That settled, she said with a smile. What was that? I inquired. With a deep breath, she opened the drawer next to our sofa and handed me a pamphlet. Emblazoned at the top was adoption. I can't bear children, she shared, her voice tinged with sadness. I had some medical tests, trying to figure out why we weren't conceiving. I felt a surge of frustration. Is this why you mentioned divorce? I questioned. She nodded. I'll be very upset with you when I'm feeling better, I said, trying to mask my anger. You seem to be quite attentive to me, aren't you? She said with a teasing smile. Sarah, I care about every part of you, I replied. So, we're square now, right? She asked. What do you mean? I was confused, wondering what else was going to happen. My mom used to say, Sarah, don't get angry. Yet even, she recounted. I made a terrible mistake, I was unfaithful. But you've balanced the scales. 
Now, there's no need for us to tread lightly around each other. Rick experienced something you never wanted to. But I guess I'll be making it up to you for a long time, she said with a smile. So, I get to be close to you in that way for the next two decades. I asked, half-jokingly. What is it with you and that? She laughed. That's not what I meant, but if it makes you happy, then sure. Just then, we heard a baby cry. Confused, Sarah and I rushed upstairs to our former guest room. It had been transformed, with a lovely white crib at its center. There stood my daughter Stevie, holding a blanket in the crib. She stopped crying when she saw me. Da da, she said joyfully. I lifted her up and she giggled. We're even now, Sarah said. I embraced her as well. Two weeks later, everything clicked into place. We met with Rick's attorney. Rick and Georgia had left wills. Their house was to be sold, and the proceeds divided among their children. Their investments, insurance, and savings were to go into a trust for the children's education and future. Deb and her husband became the guardians of the three boys, and I was naturally entrusted with the care of Stevie, being her biological father. Rick had been aware of this, and Sarah learned about Stevie when Deb presented the will and DNA tests. Admirably, Sarah embraced the role of being a mother to our daughter, a decision I am deeply thankful for. Not long after the will was read, the trucking company offered a settlement to avoid any legal actions due to the accident, clearly trying to sidestep negative publicity. I wasn't fooled by their seemingly generous act. Complaints about the company's trucks congesting our roads and filling up landfills were already rising in Michigan. It's clear that waste management is a lucrative industry. The company had done their homework. A restored Chevelle SS can fetch a hefty sum at high-end auctions. They proposed $250,000 to me, and after realizing Stevie had lost her mother, they added an additional $500,000. I took Sarah and Stevie on a lovely vacation to Ibiza before we settled back into our routine. The trip was memorable, not for the scenic beaches or the sunshine, but for a heartwarming moment on our first day there. Lying on a beach blanket, I watched Sarah walk towards a beachside cart. The sight of her confident stride was captivating. But the most touching moment was when Stevie, in her tiny voice, called out Mama as Sarah returned. That simple word still brings tears to Sarah's eyes whenever we reminisce about it. Epilogue. Ultimately, I did end our involvement. Sarah's mom and I my intention was to end it sooner, especially after reconciling with Sarah, but her mom had other ideas. She revealed a secret to me, leveraging it to keep me entangled in her schemes. One day, she excitedly showed me a new swing she had set up in her house, thinking it would spice things up. However, during one of our encounters, she suffered a hip injury. It was a challenging and awkward situation as I helped her out of the swing and into her car, driving her close to her home. I carefully moved her to the driver's seat, from where she called her husband, who then arranged for medical assistance. Her explanation for the injury was a simple accident at home. Since that incident, things between us have cooled off, but there's still a hint of awkwardness every time we meet at family gatherings. As I sit here, wrapping up my tail on my iPad, my wife Sarah descends the stairs. Honey, while Stevie is napping, we need to discuss something, she begins. I was using the electric chainsaw near the rose bushes, and it kind of hit the metal post of the fence. I'm afraid it's broken. I can't help but smile at her. Sarah, after all this time, you should know I'm not one to lose my temper. I prefer to balance the scales in my own way. My comment lights up her face with a bright smile, and she playfully gestures, signaling the start of a new, light-hearted chapter in our lives. My comment, this guy had some pretty serious luck. He gets cheated on and then in return for just swallowing a bit of his pride, he gets woman just thrown at him. 